Russia has begun its invasion of Ukraine. The United States and its allies have responded by imposing harsh sanctions against the Russian Federation. But what does this mean for the International Space Station program, of which Russia is an essential partner? Will the Russian segment break away from the ISS and become its own station? In short, no. But the following months and years might be rather awkward as the space station nears its end of life, currently planned for 2031. How this 30-year partnership evolves over the near future could signal a huge shift in the trajectory of international space cooperation in the coming years as humanity moves toward deep space destinations such as the moon. Hi, I'm Derek, and my channel Orbital Velocity is all about telling the story of human spaceflight and our journey toward becoming a multiplanetary species. Because I'm focused on human space exploration, this video will not be covering the details of the conflict itself, Russia's reasons for invading Ukraine, and why the West is condemning these actions. It's complicated and well outside the scope of this channel. I'll link to a few really good video resources below if you want to learn more. Instead, this video will focus on the effects the conflict may or may not have on the International Space Station program and why, in my opinion, activities affecting the operations of the outpost will mostly be business as usual. First, let's get an overview of the ISS program. It's a partnership among five space agencies, NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and the Russian state space corporation Roscosmos. All have a say in the operation of the ISS, but in general, the day-to-day -day functions can be split into a Russian segment controlled in Moscow and a U.S. segment controlled in Houston. Both segments are required to safely and competently operate the outpost. The Russian space program was brought aboard in 1993 as a way to continue and expand international cooperation amongst former Cold War adversaries after the fall of the Soviet Union. However, over the last 15 years, Russian military actions have had an unfortunate byproduct of straining relations between it and other ISS partner nations. Now the program's international cooperation may be about to face its biggest test to date. In February 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered the Russian military to cross into the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine. In response, the U.S. and many of its allies, including nearly all of the ISS program partners, began sanctioning aspects of the Russian government and its economy. Because of that, it can be easy to assume that it is now a bit awkward for those space agencies working with Russia on the ISS program. And it probably is, and could be more so in the future depending on the extent of the aggression incursion into Ukraine and how far sanctions and other retaliatory actions escalate. While this could end up being the toughest conflict the ISS program has had to weather, it isn't the first. In 2008, Russian troops invaded Georgia, marking what many regard as the first conventional war in Europe in the 21st century. In August of that year, Russia invaded the small ex-Soviet state located south of Russia and just east of the Black Sea. Their reasoning was to protect two areas that only Russia recognized as independent countries that wanted to be independent of Georgia. This action occurred as Georgia began aspiring to be a NATO member. Without going into details, this war lasted only several days and saw Russian troops occupy the South Ossita and Abkhazia regions. While a ceasefire was ultimately reached later that year, to this day about 20% of Georgia's internationally recognized territory is still under occupation by the Russian military. The biggest concern for the ISS program during this incursion was the potential for NASA to be unable to purchase seats on Russia's Soyuz spacecraft to get to the ISS. While there was already a prohibition on American contracts with countries that have helped Iran and North Korea with their nuclear programs, which included Russia, NASA did have a waiver. That waiver was in need of renewal in 2008, and it was ultimately renewed, but at the time, there was a real concern that access to the space station would be in jeopardy. The space shuttle program was edging closer to retirement in 2011, and there wasn't expected to be any form of replacement ready until at least 2015. Those fears resurfaced again in 2014 when Russia decided to invade Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. In this instance, a political revolution occurred in Ukraine, another ex-Soviet state, in February 2014 that resulted in the removal of their pro-Russian president and the election of a pro-Western government later in the year. Meanwhile, pro-Russian activists in the Crimean Peninsula to the south instated their own pro-Russian Crimean prime minister for the region and asked Russia for assistance to ensure peace. While Russia denied its troops were entering the peninsula, Russian flags were seen raised over buildings. There was also an increase in soldiers with unmarked uniforms. Over the following month, a referendum on joining Russia was given, with the vast majority of votes siding with annexation. However, many residents abstained, and there was no international observation of the vote. It was declared by the international community to be illegal. 
When sanctions were imposed on Russia as a result of that conflict, there was a lot of rhetoric by members of Russia's government threatening to end their involvement in the ISS program in 2020. Then Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin, who is now the director of Roscosmos, sent in a statement that the Russian segment can exist independently from the American one, the US one cannot. The accuracy of that statement aside, after he was sanctioned by the US government, he tweeted, I suggest to the US to bring their astronauts to the International Space Station using a trampoline. To make matters more awkward, the Russian space agency announced in September 2014 that it was moving survival training for all Soyuz flyers to the Russian naval base now located in Crimea. If international crews did not complete that training, they would not have been allowed to fly aboard Soyuz. There were also concerns in the broader space industry that the availability of several Russian-built rocket engines would be jeopardized because of U.S. sanctions. Since 2014, the U.S. has regained independent access to the space station with the commercial crew program in SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. Moreover, most of the functions of the ISS, including crew and cargo resupply, have cross-redundancy between the U.S. segment and the Russian segment. In recent years, other incidents have called into question the strength of Roscosmos' partnership with the rest of the ISS program. The most notable is the mysterious hole that was found in Soyuz MS-08 in August of 2018. Pictures transmitted to the ground showed a roughly 2mm hole that appeared to be drilled from the inside and covered up via a very low-quality patch job. While the most likely cause of this was human error during processing on the ground, the Russian space agency has continuously said that it was a deliberate act done in orbit. Most recently, they began publicly blaming NASA astronaut Serena Anand Chancellor. This ridiculous claim has been disputed by NASA. Also worth noting is an anti-satellite test performed by Russia in 2021 that received condemnation by all ISS partners. That test not only put US and international astronauts at risk, it also put Russian cosmonauts who lived together aboard the ISS at risk should a piece of debris strike the outpost. While not related to the current conflict, it might be a clue as to how much the Kremlin values the ISS program. This brings us to the current invasion into Ukraine by Russian troops in 2022. Many things are happening at a fast pace and a lot can still change, but it's entirely possible this conflict could result in the largest war in Europe since the end of the Second World War in 1945. While Russia is not at war with the US, NATO, or any of the ISS partners, the escalating sanctions and other punitive actions from the international community could and likely will extend into the space industry. Already, Roscosmos director Dmitry Rogozin said in a statement via Twitter, We greatly value our professional relations with NASA, but as a Russian and a citizen of Russia, I am completely unhappy with the openly hostile US policy towards my country. While his motivations are not clear, this statement was likely a way to toe the line between supporting Vladimir Putin, where goes it was in his inner circle, and maintaining a relationship with NASA for the ISS program. Regardless, exactly how this conflict will affect the ISS program partnership, or how Russia would respond, is not known, but there are several potential scenarios. These range from the very unlikely possibility of the Russian segment breaking away from the rest of the International Space Station to form an independent outpost, to more minor but long-term actions. So, could Russia break away their segment from the ISS? Eh, maybe, but really no. There are several issues with this. The first being that the two segments are integrated in ways that make it difficult to detach. While the US side has four massive control moment gyroscopes to maintain attitude control, any large movements still usually require, at least in part, help from thrusters on the Russian side. Moreover, traditionally, the Russian segment and Russian cargo ships have been required for station reboots, although the Cygnus spacecraft now has that capability. Without the Russian segment, the rest of the ISS would have a lot of control and attitude problems. On the other hand, the Russian segment gets much of its power from the massive solar arrays on the integrated truss assembly, which is located on the US segment. The only fully active arrays on the Russian segment are on the Zvezda module and the Naoko module, neither would likely produce enough to power useful operations. Another module, called Zarya, also has arrays, but those were partially folded in 2007 to make way for the radiators on the US segment. But the real problem with Zarya is that it is technically owned by NASA. It was paid for by the US in the 90s in order to accelerate the start of ISS assembly. And all that is before thinking about the logistics of planning the multiple spacewalks needed to disconnect power and data cables in order to facilitate this hypothetical breakaway. Ultimately, this path likely results in the ISS being abandoned. So breaking away isn't realistic, but what about if the hatch to the US segment between Zarya and the Unity module was closed and cosmonauts and astronauts just had to pretend to have separate stations? 
Well, first, as long as there is a U.S. astronaut that has a seat in the Soyuz spacecraft, that won't happen for safety reasons. If there's an emergency, there needs to be available access to the spacecraft you came aboard in, just in case you need to use it as a lifeboat or to shelter in place. Right now, NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei, who has been aboard the ISS since April of 2021, is assigned to land in Soyuz MS-19 at the end of March of 2022. However, no U.S. astronaut is assigned to the next Soyuz launch to the space station, also in March of 2022. Even so, if the segments were isolated, there is still the problem with Zarya. It's owned by NASA. And if they close the station between Zarya and the Zvezda module, there's the problem of the Rasvet module, which is directly attached to Zarya. There is also the problem of redundancy for life support. Many of the Russian life support systems are aging, and when they break, the U.S. life support systems can pick up the slack while equipment is being repaired. But let's say the Russian space agency went that route. The U.S. could easily retaliate by stopping the power from being routed to the Russian side. Again, that wouldn't be beneficial for the U.S. either, as it would prevent the Russian side from providing propulsion capabilities for the outpost as a whole. Also, let's be real. These crews have trained together for years. Many are friends with each other. Any order to sever ties between the two segments, especially if it increases the risk for potential death, is likely to not be followed. So a path like this, or similar, results in significant increases of the risk for loss of the station or loss of life. If there are to be any changes over the coming months as a result of Russia's actions against Ukraine, it may come in the form of smaller actions. One such action could be the cancellation of plans for a seat exchange program between commercial crew spacecraft and the Soyuz spacecraft. Currently, SpaceX's Crew-5 mission is expected to see the first Russian cosmonaut fly on Dragon to the ISS, Anna Kikina. In exchange, NASA astronaut Francisco Rubio is currently scheduled to fly on Soyuz MS-22. Both launches are slated for this fall. The cancellation could come as a result of U.S. sanctions or possibly as a unilateral decision by the Russian government. If this exchange program is canceled, things could still continue to operate normally. However, if Soyuz or Crew Dragon experience any significant launch delays either due to a failure or some other reason, there is a very real possibility of one side decrewing the outpost for a time. This is significant as there has always been at least one American astronaut and one Russian cosmonaut at the ISS since Expedition 1 in November of 2000. Once Boeing Starliner starts flying, that risk is significantly reduced for the U.S., but operational Starliner flights aren't expected until at least spring of 2023. The problem may not stop at launching crew. Depending on how long the crisis lasts, there could potentially be delays in the U.S. resupply spacecraft. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft launches atop an Antares rocket. Its first stage is built in Ukraine and has Russian-built RD-181 engines. The company said earlier this month that it has inventory for two more Antares launches, one in the summer and one in early 2023. Should the crisis persist too long, Antares may not be available for use. Cygnus does have the ability to fly atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket and has done so several times in the past. However, all remaining Atlas Vs have been purchased and earmarked for various customers. ULA is retiring the Atlas V in favor of its new Vulcan rocket. Additionally, while most ISS partner nations have agreed to continue operating the outpost through the end of the decade, Russia still has only committed to 2024. There is still a possibility that Russia really does end its partnership then, but then the country's space program would have no destination. They may be able to partner with the Chinese Tiangong space station, but the country's current crew-capable launch pads are not able to reach the Asian country's space station as it operates at a lower inclination. So, barring the construction of new launch pads at lower latitudes, if Russia pulls out of the ISS program, it won't have a low Earth orbit space destination. I suppose Russian cosmonauts could hitch rides on the Chinese Shenzhou spacecraft, but I doubt the country would want to do something like that. While none of these actions are ideal, it allows station operations to continue relatively normally until the Earth-based conflict is resolved or gives enough time for a longer-term solution to come about. Either way, short of both the U.S. and Russia agreeing to abandon the $150 billion International Space Station, there will be at least some cooperation between the two countries for the time being. What happens in the coming weeks, months, and years may be an indication for the future of international cooperation in space. When the ISS was started, and throughout much of its operational life, the outpost has been seen as a model for cooperation between nations, even those with problems on Earth. It offered the promise of a future where all nations could figure out how to get along and work together for the betterment of humanity. And while that is still true, what we may be seeing right now is a fracturing of that promise into a new reality. Already, Russia and the United States are beginning to follow separate paths when it comes to post-ISS space plans. 
The United States and its allies in Europe, Canada, Japan, and others, have all begun signing the Artemis Accords as a framework for cooperation in the United States-led Artemis program, which aims to return humans to the moon in the middle of this decade. Russia has refused to join Artemis or the Accords, saying the Accords are an attempt to create international space law that favors the United States. Instead, Russia looks to partner with China and its deep space ambitions. Under that cooperative effort, the two countries look to establish a robotic outpost at the Lunar South Pole by the end of the decade. This outpost wouldn't be too far from where the Artemis program's base camp might be located. No matter what happens to the ISS program, it appears that international cooperation in space may be morphing into partnerships limited to close allies rather than broad coalitions, like what formed as a result of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. Regardless, if the ISS program weathers this conflict relatively unscathed, it will show just how important of a model it is for international cooperation. What do you think will happen to the ISS program as a result of this conflict? Let me know in the comments below, and please be civil and stay topical to the ISS program. I made this video because there were a lot of questions and speculation on social media about the fate of the International Space Station in light of the current events in Ukraine. No matter how the ISS ultimately fares through these events, the real immediate concern should be and is on the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine because of Russia's unprovoked full-scale invasion. At the time of publishing, Kyiv is on the verge of falling. My heart goes out to all those being affected, and I truly hope peace comes as soon as possible. If you want to donate to a charity that is working to help those affected by this atrocity, I'll link to them in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, Ad Astra.